I'm now joined by former NFL player Brandon Noble, who is a super bug survivor. He says MRSA, his, his MRSA infection is responsible for ending his NFL career, and he has been an ambassador for spreading the word about antibiotic-resistant infection. Thanks for joining us. I, I know this, uh, this is a personal story to you. I know you've written about it. Can you tell our viewers uh, your experience? Yeah, so uh, back in the, in the early 2000s, uh, I, was, uh, I was blessed with, uh, with a MRSA experience. I was playing for the, uh, the Washington Redskins, uh, I guess the commanders now. Uh, and uh, I had uh, signed as a free agent there. And in 2003, I actually, uh, I tore my ACL, my MCL, my PCL, and dislocated my kneecap in my left knee. And, and I'm telling you that for a little bit of perspective on, on this whole thing, right? So that that's technically a career ending injury. Uh, I came back the next year and, and was able to play football for, for the Skins. And from a, a, after the 2004 season, uh, my, my right knee had a little cartilage floating around in it. And, I, you know, I was at the point in my life and my career where, like, it was like, hey, we should probably go take care of that right now. So I, I went back to my orthopedic. And uh, he, he cleaned me out, just a nice, easy flush and got all the debris out and just a scope, right? I expected, especially after blowing my left knee out, you know, being up and moving in a couple of days wouldn't be an issue to get back to training for camp. And uh, they took my stitches out about seven days after, after the operation. And I was at Redskin Park and uh, sorry, I don't, know what, I don't know what they call it now. They're the Redskins to me. So I'm just going to keep saying that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and, and they took the stitches out and... I woke up the next morning about 24 hours later and I had this little tiny hot spot. Like it was like the size of a quarter on my knee, right where the porthole was. And, and it just felt like somebody was lighting me on fire right there. And so I went into the facility and told the training staff, the training staff sent me to the, to the team orthopedic who unfortunately I had not gotten along with really well over the course of my time there. I didn't let him do my, my reconstruction on my left knee and, so he had some kind of unkind words for me. And, and he told me, you know, he looked at it. He goes, well, you probably got an infection. Why don't you go back to your, your doctor in Charlotte uh, and have him take care of that? And so this was like a Thursday night. Uh, you know, I called my agent. I was like, I don't know what to do here. Uh, you know, all right, take it easy. You know, they do a little test. And, and within 24 hours, uh, I am on the sofa unconscious laying there with a leg the size of a tree trunk. Um, you know, it looks like it's on fire. Uh, and basically my mother-in-law who's a nurse was, was coming into town for my daughter's second birthday party, which was happening on Saturday. And, uh, she looked at my leg and, and she looked at my wife, Mary Kate and said, Mary, you got to get in the hospital right now. My, my agent called the orthopedic surgeon for the Washington capitals who he, he knew, uh, they sent me down to Sibley medical. And uh, I learned about MRSA for the first time. I was laying in that hospital bed after they kind of calmed the, you know, got the, got the pain to a manageable level. And uh, the infectious disease doctor came in and said, you know, sir, you've got MRSA. And uh, honestly, if you'd waited another 12 to 24 hours, we'd probably be cutting your leg off or, or something worse would be happening. And uh, so, so there I was, right? I'd never heard of it, had no idea what it was. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm laying there saying, having somebody tell me that they might be cutting my leg off uh, or I might die. Uh, and, uh, it was, it was, an, uh, at the time, again, I was heavily sedated, uh, but as I look back on it, you know, um, that's a very scary moment to get to in about 24 hours. And then you find out that you're not alone. You learned about MRSA. You, you didn't know about before. And a lot of people don't until they until they get it and then they educate themselves. Was it was a difficult time also just mentally with your family and your and your colleagues in the NFL? And they probably didn't understand it uh, fully either. Yeah, it's look the, at that point. The, this was I guess so. This was like two thousand four, two thousand five. Like nobody again, like you said, like not a lot of people talk about it right now, and definitely weren't talking about it back then. And I was one of the first guys in the NFL to get it. And that year, there was kind of this little outbreak in the league where there was a pocket of guys in New York. There was a pocket of guys, I think, in Cleveland and in Tampa. Uh, and we had a handful of guys in Washington get it that year. And, and it was really kind of one of these things that all of a sudden the NFL became very aware of and, and started handling things differently in the locker room, uh, the training room, you know, just kind of how we, we you know, look, football players are disgusting um, and, and kind of better hygiene as, as a unit, as a group. 
Um, but yeah, look, I had, I had two little kids. Uh, I had a, you know, like I said, it was my daughter's second birthday. I have a wife. Um, and actually the, the second go around, I actually got MRSA a second time about a year later. Uh, and, and my wife, I, I got dropped off to the hospital on Thursday night for an emergency surgery. My wife came in on Friday morning and gave birth to our third child and she beat me out of the hospital. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, look, and, and I became a, a serious germaphobe for a while and so did my wife. As far as you, you are telling your story, a dramatic one uh, from the patient perspective, what, what advice would you have for other people uh, who are told by their doctor for the first time you have MRSA? What would you advise them since you've been through it now twice? Well, I think the, the first thing is, is, is making sure that you're getting the proper medication. You know, the, 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 the team orthopedics sent me home with, uh, I wanted to say it was Keflex, but I'm not 100% sure, just a regular over-the-counter antibiotic, which wasn't going to do anything. I ended up having a pick line in my arm for six weeks getting pumped full of vancomycin the first time. And then I had allergic reaction to that. So the second time they gave me a pick line and a cocktail uh, of antibiotics. And, and it, is, it is a scary moment, right? You know, it really is. The good thing is, again, this is 2004, there were drugs available uh, that they hit me with and, and they, they, they flushed me out, right? I had surgeries uh, to, to take care of those things. But it is, it is a very scary moment uh, that, that you feel like you don't have any real control, right? We have this idea that, hey, I go to the doctor, I go to the hospital, they're going to have the answers, they're going to fix me, I'm going to be okay. Uh, and when you're told, hey, we're going to try these drugs and hopefully they work, uh, that's that's an eye opener right there. So so you know, I mean, look, I, I was fortunate. I had the best care in the world, right? The NFL, they they take care of their guys, and uh, and I was in that situation. So I, I was very lucky. But I've I've coached high school football, Division two football. Uh, you know, I've I've coached ball, been around the game my whole life. Not every place has that level of care that I was fortunate to have in the NFL. Why have you decided to, to speak out and what do you think that, uh, you know, we, we've been discussing today government policies and legislation. What, what do you think that needs to be done to, to put more of the spotlight on this issue? Well, I, I think, number one, it's, it's a, I, I came in, you know, obviously not, not through the whole, the whole talk here, but I caught the kind of tail end of the last <coughs> segment. And, and I think really one of, the, one of the scary things to me is that this is the same conversation that was being had 20 years ago when I had this in Washington, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is classic, you know, uh, you know, gridlock. I don't know what you want to call it. Right. You know, but like, is anything gotten done in the last two decades since I had it? And it, it sounds like we're still having the same conversation. That's a little scary, right? This is something that kills people that, that, that is an incredibly painful process no matter how you have it right if you have it in your skin or inside of you this hurts uh, like i said i tore my acl my mcl my pcl dislocated my kneecap the MRSA way worse mm -hmm. way worse um so, so i think that the, the the frustrating thing is i keep coming back and having these conversations and hearing the same conversations coming out of dc coming out of the the pharma world and and nothing's getting done right look how fast we flipped this vaccine thing over for covid like just just do it, man. I get, it kills people. And, and I do think, to be honest with you, because of the fact that it affects everyone, um, as opposed to sometimes that, that group that can stand up there and say, hey, like, this is really affecting us. Uh, sometimes in America, we don't really move too fast when it, when it kind of goes after everyone, obviously COVID being, you know, a, a, a different situation. Um, but look, look, we can do miraculous things. Our, our, our pharma, our scientists, our people, Right. They're 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 capable of, of anything. Um, you know, take take yeah. the handcuffs off and, and let them go. Like make make it worth their while, whatever you've got to do uh, to, to help people. I mean, I, I heard somebody when I came in this thing, it kills more people than HIV, you know, yeah. worldwide. Right. You know, like that, that's terrifying. Like, why don't people know that? Why don't people talk about it? Why is it a bigger deal? Brandon, we've run out of time, but thank you uh, for sharing your story today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on.